The next item of business is consideration of business motion 11400 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable for the Stage 3 consideration of the Historic Environment Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 11400. Moved. Thank you. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 11400, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. We now move to topical questions. Question number one, Jim Hume. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to reports that patients are being put at risk by its failure to adequately fund GPs. Alex Neil. Presiding officer, under the tenure of this government, we've increased the Scottish Government's contribution to primary medical services by 10%. And working with health boards, we're ensuring there's now more money than ever being invested into local GP services. The investment in primary care has seen the number of GPs in Scotland increase by 5.7% under this government. And this year, we've ensured a GP pay increase and agreed a new three-year GP contract, which frees up GPs to spend more time with their patients by reducing bureaucracy. However, I believe we can go further, and that's why today I've announced the new £40 million primary care development fund, which will allow our GPs and primary care professionals to evolve our health service to meet the changing needs of the people of Scotland. The new fund aims to empower GPs to develop initiatives that address challenges in workload, tackle health inequalities in deprived and rural areas, and meet the changing needs of the people of Scotland. Jim Hume. I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and, of course, I welcome the announcement earlier today that £40 million is to be made available for GPs in rural and deprived either areas, whether it's new money or not. And, Presiding Officer, I think this sudden announcement highlights the wisdom and foresight of yourself to have topical questions every week if the result is a rapid alteration in policy. But the reality is that a number of whole-time equivalent GPs in post at the end of January 2013 is just 35 higher than the 2009 survey number. Organisations involved in the sector have warned that boosting services will require much more than a one-off 40 million. So what's the Cabinet Secretary's long-term plan to ensure that we have an adequate number of GPs in Scotland so that we can ensure that a quarter of patients that can't get appointments within a week can? Flattery will get you everywhere, Mr Hume, Cabinet yeah, Secretary. Uh, can I disappoint you, Presiding Officer, because I did tell the Royal College last week that I would be making this announcement. Uh, so um, can I say this is part of a wider strategy in terms of primary care. We have now negotiated a three-year contract with GPs in Scotland to get stability into the system. We have substantially reduced the bureaucratic requirements on them to free up time to be with their patients. And I've instructed every health board in Scotland, the territorial board, to increase the funding for GP and primary care this year and next year. And I will continue to do so until we uh, have the proper level of funding required. There is a national shortage of GPs partly because of the feminisation of the workforce leading to much more part-time working, partly because of the work-life balance which is making it more difficult to attract GPs into the profession, people into the profession of GP, and partly because there are particular challenges in rural and remote and island communities where we have extreme difficulty on recruitment and retention. We're working across a wide range of areas with a wide range of initiatives with all the key stakeholders to address all of these issues. But I do recognise there are challenges, but we're facing up to those challenges, and I believe putting the resources in place to successfully face up to those challenges. Briefly, Mr Hume. Uh, thank you, and, and thanks to the Cabinet Secretary again. In, in, in addition to the conventional practice nursing role, advanced nurse practitioners, uh, who can improve access to GP services, and this already happens in many parts of Scotland where the uh, nurses with advanced qualifications can diagnose and prescribe medication for a wide range of long-term uh, conditions. Is the Scottish Government uh, going to put in place resources and support to, ve to develop more roles like this so that the whole team can provide access to healthcare as part of a long-term approach to workforce planning rather than more stopgap measures? Yeah, absolutely, Presiding Officer. Um, I've been very impressed by what's called the NUCA system in Alaska. 
uh, where they have completely redesigned GP services. They recognise that something like 30% of the people seeing GPs, only 30% really needed to see the GP. The other 70% would be better dealt with by a clinical psychologist, a podiatrist, an advanced nurse practitioner, or whatever. And over the last few years, they've redesigned their primary care services, and as a result of that, have dramatically reduced the incidence and the level of hospitalisation, and got a much more efficient system than they had before. And I believe there's a lot of lessons we can learn. We've already run a pilot of this project in Fife successfully, and a, a GP practice is going to adopt this model in Edinburgh, and it's being officially opened on Friday. I'll see if I can get Mr. Human invitation. <laughs> Ailey McLeod. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In welcoming the new uh, £40 million Primary Care Development Fund, can the Cabinet Secretary tell me how much has been transferred from the performance-related pay system, COAF, to core practice funding in the last two years, and whether this transfer has had a beneficial impact on how much time GPs have when treating their patients? Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, over 2013-14 and 2014-15, the COAF, uh, which is the framework for this in the GP contract, was reduced by a total of 341 points to a total of 659 points, moving 14, £47 million total funding of GP income into core funding and out of performance-related pay. This was negotiated with the Scottish General Practitioners Committee, who agreed this would help reduce the bureaucratic burden on GPs, freeing up GPs to spend more time with patients. Richard Simpson. Can I uh, compliment the Cabinet Secretary on the general direction of travel? But I think he would agree with me the first step is actually recognising the challenges we face. So, for example, the fact that in the northeast of England, as opposed to the UK as a whole, there are more full time equivalent GPs than there are in Scotland. Uh, and this is reflected in some of the report of the Nuffield report that 74 practices in Lothian have closed to new registration and that, that this is actually occurring in other, in other health boards as well and that in Millport and Drummond to take just two examples uh, we're unable to recruit GPs as a consequence of the dispensing changes that I know we're trying to address now but it's difficult and that locums are really difficult to obtain, which breaks the pressure back on partners in the practice really difficult. So uh, I, I accept his long-term vision, and I understand the Alaska concept, um, but that's not going to change things overnight. Uh, how does he see the current local development plans, which he's seen and I haven't been able to see, uh, actually affecting general practice this year and next year? Well, as I've said, uh, I, under the LDP guidance for this year and next year, I've instructed the boards to put additional resources into GP practices. And I think what those GPs will do is buy in particular services that they require. For example, as I mentioned at the committee meeting this morning, in the deep end practices, the addition of a link worker into the deep end practice is making a very substantial difference. In those practices where they're not in a deep end situation, but where they've got an above average percentage of patients who are elderly or very elderly, uh, it would be a different type of use of the money. But I'm quite happy to let the GPs make the decision about how they need to spend these resources, as long as in return for putting the resources in, we get an improvement in terms of the ability to service the patients in terms of getting appointments quicker and all the other things that we all want to see. I don't want to just write a blank cheque and not get something in return. I want to make sure we're going to get improved performance and quality in return for the money we're putting in. All right, Mill. Uh, thank you. Um, recruitment and retention have a, a, is a recurring problem in general practice. And I mean, the main reason I supported the 2004 contract was be because G the young GPs weren't coming in because of night work. And, and I was happy to support what happened then. So given that there's currently the same sort, not because of night work, but the same sort of problem going on in recruiting and retaining within general practice, ha has the, the Minister got any, or the Cabinet Secretary got any uh, thoughts on incentives, particular incentives to encourage young medical graduates 
to go. And I know he's told the Health Committee today of you know, the need for perhaps more medical graduates, but these medical graduates need to be guided once they do yeah, qualify yeah. and would ha have plans to attract them into general practice. Secretary. Presenting officer, from the work we've done, it's not a financial incentive that really is the issue, as I'm sure uh, Mrs. Mrs. Milne would agree. It's more about the work-life balance. And of course, it's a kind of cat and horse situation. If we had more GPs working in each practice, each GP would need to work fewer hours. If they work fewer hours, it would be easier to attract more GPs into the practice or into the profession. So I think it's putting resources in. And I think Jim Hume was absolutely right when he said that um, given the shortage of GPs and given that a lot of the people the GPs are seeing could be more appropriately treated by an allied health professional or an advanced nurse practitioner, we need to get into a, a system which you should be able to do sooner rather than later in each GP practice where we triage patients to make sure that they actually go to the right person and the right person isn't necessarily always a GP. And I believe if we did that much more extensively, it would take a lot of the pressure out of GPs. And if we manage to do that, I think the work-life balance would improve and therefore the image of the profession and the ability to recruit and retain GPs would improve as well. Question two, Sandra White. Thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how the decision to hold a vote in the future of the European arrest warrant before 20th of November could impact on justice in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Ken McCaskill. Well, as I've already told the Chamber, I very much regret that the UK Government saw fit, with no pretense of consultation, to put our participation in the European arrest warrant system at risk. Uh, we hope the UK Government will win the vote and succeed in opting back in. If not, there has been uniform concern across the Crown Office, Defence Lawyers and Police Scotland at the loss of an instrument which has seen hundreds of individuals, many suspected of serious crimes, return to Scotland from other member states or to other member states from Scotland to face justice. Sandra White. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that reply and uh, absolutely agree in the fact that it would be very detrimental and dangerous if uh, the UK Government does not opt into the European arrest warrant. And I wonder if he could uh, you know, further explain to me exactly what type of limbo uh, you know, Scotland will be in if they do throw out you know, the vote on the 20th of November. But can I ask the Cabinet Secretary also, that does he agree with me that to hold this vote uh, on such an important issue just before uh, the Rochester by-election has more to do with political manoeuvring uh, than what is best for the people of Scotland and the people in the rest of the UK as well? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I do, and I think this isn't just the position of the Scottish Government. It's the position of prosecutors, defence lawyers, rights campaigners and police, not only in Scotland but throughout the UK. Uh, the European arrest warrant has served us well. It has brought people to justice in this country, some charged with the most heinous crimes. I'm very grateful to the authorities, whether in Slovakia or Poland, who have uh, assisted. And equally, as I said in our answer to the other question, we have also... Uh, supported returning those to justice elsewhere. So I think that this is political moving by the uh, coalition government down south that is threatening what has worked well to serve justice not only in Scotland but indeed within the European Union. That's right. I thank the Cabinet Secretary, and that was one of the, the reasons I raised, raised the, the further question. Uh, obviously, we know that the rest of Europe is supportive of it and have been lobbying uh, Westminster to support it. Uh, I think that the worry that we have in this Parliament is that uh, if they do not make a decision in November, then we were going to be left with this limbo and take a decision later on. But I do think, as the Cabinet Secretary also says, it is political posturing when there is this by-election on in Rochester, uh, which the Conservatives are obviously contending against. Against you, Kip. I think there might have been a question here, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Yes. Well, I mean, I think uh, some of these things about legislating in haste and repenting at leisure, I think this was one of the initial matters that hadn't been given any consideration to by the Conservative administration. I've spoken to numerous ministers over the time. Uh, they're going to considerable difficulties and to a great extent to try and resolve matters of their own volition. Uh, I am hopeful that not only have we managed to sort things out, but they will win the vote. But if it were not to occur, then I think the interests of justice in Scotland would be the worse for it, uh, as would indeed the interests of the justice throughout the European Union. Uh, I do think, as a 
say this is, as I said before, simply political posturing, and it is damaging uh, not only to those who work within the justice system, but it's also damaging to all of us in our society who wish to ensure that justice is done. Roderick Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, I was fortunate to be able to attend the Human Trafficking Summit on the 17th of October, in which there were representatives of the prosecuting authorities, not only from Scotland, England and Wales, Northern Ireland, but the Republic of Ireland. And during that summit, there was unanimity amongst uh, the prosecutors in the United Kingdom as to the importance of uh, the European arrest warrant in relation to human trafficking. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that point? Uh, absolutely. I think it's a very valid point. Human trafficking is a crime which, by its very definition, does not know or accept uh, boundaries uh, or jurisdictions. Uh, we know in Scotland that many people being trafficked are coming in from countries within the European Union. That's a matter that we've been briefed on by Police Scotland. Uh, so I can fully understand the point that Mr Campbell is making and indeed the point that was quite clear uh, at that meeting seeking to traffic, uh, tackle that uh, uh, dreadful crime that actually the European arrest warrant has served us well, is a threat and does ensure that justice can be done wherever possible. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We now move to the next item of business, which is a stage three proceedings on the